house one day and it has a pool table, coin machine with a new goose head, and then this player piano in the corner. That's a, that would be a fun basement to hang out in. Um, so when we're looking at that player piano and kind of what's going on and how it works, is that analog or is it digital? What do you think? All right, so we have a vote for analog. What do you think? All right, and a vote for digital. I just want to get a fill for everybody else. So give me a thumbs up if you chose analog. Give me a thumbs up if you chose digital. FYI, the digitals win. Can someone tell me why? Why the piano roll is digital? Why is the piano roll digital? Because there's like holes and like lamps, kind of like ones and zeros on it. Oh, just like ones and zeros for binary or that on or off, there is a hole or not hole. And that gets interpreted, air can go through, drop the key, or not drop the key. So the longer it is, it's kind of like a, a longer sequence of ones, longer sequence of zeros. So it is almost identical to binary code. So a piano roll, could that be turned into digital uh, to play on our computers very quickly and easily? Because it's straight up already that one zero code. It's just hole or not hole instead, and how long those holes are versus how long those not holes are. So it is that code or pieces of information that have that very set value, um, if you remember that ties to our definitions, rather than that continuous non-stop. Um, were there other questions or comments? What song is that? This is called the Box Dancer, which um, there's actually one company in the United States that still makes piano rolls. Um, so for $16, you can pay them to make any song. So my dad's had them make a couple. He's had the Frozen song and a couple of the Moana songs um, get made because, of course, my kids don't care about the older songs. They did the other grandkids, so they've got some of the more modern ones that have been made to be able to do it. Um, is that like the kind of stuff they do in like movies? So like, so like they charge like jewelry and like clean them? Yeah. And they've got ones now, like if you ever see them, like the player pianos in um, Costco and stuff, it's, um, it's still using that code, but it's not using the air to make them drop. It's <laughs> So just how it actually functions is slightly different, but yeah, they use that in movies and stuff like that to get that good creepy effect. All right, so I think that hits the piano rolls. But again, that limits your music listening to just piano. Um, so that's where there was still more development to get more variety. So that's where the gramophone record was developed. So they took the same idea from the phonographic cylinder, the idea of the carvings that created the vibrations. Um, but because there was the drawbacks with the wax and that kind of stuff, and then having that tube limited how much, so they created the record, which the records I'm playing today would, could be put on, when it decides to come back, it could be put on this old school gramophone and function exactly the same because the basic storage has not changed in well over 100 years. Yeah, it's over 100 years. Um, because they haven't found a way to make that good analog recording any better than they have before. How it actually gets played has been improved to not have to crank it so it can spin. Um, and so what happens on this, there's a needle that goes on top of the thing that's got the carvings of that continuous um, vibrations that were carved into it. And as the needle goes over the vibrations or the carvings, it vibrates. And as it's vibrating, because anything vibrating will create sound. And then the gramophone or that megaphone looking thing will amplify the sound make it bigger. Uh, mine, that was bought from Sam's Club just a few years ago, it still has the needle that vibrates, but then it uses electronic speakers to amplify the sound rather than the megaphone thing. Um, but I'm gonna show you a video real quick, and not a video, but some pictures under a microscope showing what it actually looks like. Because that'll help you kind of understand that idea of it being continuous, that analog. So the vibrations from the sound literally are carved 
in those grooves that are on this chunk of plastic. So that's kind of a looking at a microscopic version of what's literally carved on here. So tiny little changes cause the needle to move a little bit and you can see we've got these rings around it and so we've got lots of those carvings that can then create the, the sound. Would they carve it on by playing the music on a blank sheet instead of... Yes, like so they'll have blanks so it's just a straight blank piece and so then that'll make your master copy and then they can have the needle on this one and then it'll just be making copies because then they, they have a fancy setup that'll have the needle then going over this to then carve it on a new blank. So it's it's pretty pretty impressive, especially like how long ago they developed it. And in over 100 years, they haven't found a better quality way to really preserve that analog. Because people that are really into music, even now, they tend to have pretty significant record collections because I can't tell the difference, but people that have a really good ear for music, um, they say that there's a richness in the music that you can hear with vinyl, that even really high quality digital recordings you can't, which I believe them, but I don't get it, but people that have a good ear for music can tell that. I'm gonna show you another photograph um, of it that's kind of a closer view of those carvings, because there's the double-sided um, thing. So that hopefully kind of gives some perspective on that continuous carving to get that continuous analog sound. Um, so our gramophone, which is the same as our vinyl record players we have today, um, our analog, yeah, how much music talk. can be stored on those vinyl records? How much music can be on that chunk of plastic? So 15 to 22 minutes per side. All right, 15 to 22 minutes per side, which would end up being you know, that 30 to 45 minutes total. Um, so I've got this Beatles album right here. It's actually got two records in it, and it can hold 27 um, of the Beatles songs on it. So just kind of a little idea, because we're gonna compare it to some of the digital ones in just a minute. All right, so we've got our gramophone, but we wanted to try something, because especially the teenagers would be going to hang out with their friends, having to carry around their record collection, which they did, so they could listen to music as they were hanging out. And they could get scratched easily, because if you've noticed when I play my music, um, have you ever noticed there's kind of like that scratchy or ticky sound every once in a while? Dust that's over those carvings, the needle bump over it, and it creates a different vibration. And so sometimes dust can create that scratchy sound. Literal scratches can do it. Even your fingerprints can scratch on the vinyl, so it's something you've got to be careful with because it can get messed up um, by creating vibrations in different ways pretty easy. Um, so the reel-to-reel -reel was developed. And what do you guys think the reel-to-reel? -reel? Was that analog or digital? Okay, that one is analog. Now, it's one that I initially am like, that can't be analog because it's magnetic patterns. How is that not digital? But just like the, um, the vinyl record had continuous carvings, it's basically a continuous path of the magnetic pa pattern. So rather than a carving, it's the magnetic path that was captured on the tape. So it's still that continuous path trying to capture everything and that analog. Um, so that's why it's analog instead of digital. It's just instead of a carving, a magnetic trail, basically. Um, so how much could that store? How much could the reel-to-reel -reel store? Um, All right, so 3,600 feet. So just kind of a little magnetic strip. 3,600 feet, you would need that much on some pretty big reels to be able to get six and a half hours 150 feet could give you two minutes. So depending on how big of a reel you had, um, you can have different amounts of music. However, these were definitely not portable. Um, and then of course, touching the tape and other things could mess it up. So they did put effort into trying to improve it. Um, one of the improvements they made in the 60s was they made a four track. All that means 
is rather than, like if it was a band and you're recording a band, um, before this, you'd have to have everybody in the same room at the same time and record everybody at once. And there's all sorts of background noise and other in interference that would be caught in the recording. But when they were able to develop this, they were able to have the vocals and make sure they could get a good, clean recording of just the vocals. And then they could have the different musicians, up to four. Um, so they could have four different recordings so they could get the different sounds really clean and crisp. And then they could be played at the same time. So it still used that magnetic path um, idea, but they were able to play basically multiple paths at the same time. So they could get a little bit of the cleaner music um, to be able to be recorded. So again, um, this wasn't super portable. Um, and that's where the compact cassette came out, also in the 60s. How many of you guys recognize something like this? If you've watched Guardians of the Galaxy, that's a big thing a lot of people recognize from that. When they developed the compact cassette, they basically were able to take, make the reel to reel portable. And it's stored in these cases. So that would make um, these two records, 